Hello and welcome to a special uh, Everyone's Locked in Their House Plague edition of Botcast. I'm John Botcast coming from my my house. Hi there, I'm Eamon Botcast coming from my house. Oh, this is weird. <laughs> in other news, um, I planted some flower seeds. Oh, nice. We'll see. What were they? Um, some red flowers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I thought let's 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 do up that piece of shit garden that I have in the back, um, and and it will be something for me and the Wayne to do. So uh, uh, I went into quarantine Dazda, uh, and I just got what was it like? It just said like a sea of red. Um, so okay. so I just bought like it was like three packets for four pounds or whatever. <laughs> so. I got just. I just thought I'll just get colours because I don't know. I don't know the type of flowers. So I got a sea of blue, a sea of white, and a sea of red. And then inadvertently, I have bought. The, the, I didn't mean to do this, but I bought the colours of the Union Jack. <laughs> you got bricks at flower oh, bed. Fuck. I, you know, it's. I just. I just. I was thinking about primary colours. That the that the Wayne will enjoy, so I thought blue blue and red blue blue red and white right outside of yeah. that connotation they are certainly <laughs> colours, um, <laughs> and I, I should have I I realised as soon as I bought them I should have bought some green flowers and some uh, orange flowers and all different you know I, I'd like it to look like a rainbow at the end but unfortunately. Mm. Uh, when they come up, uh, it'll look like uh, I'm a big, big Brexiteer. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, do you want to do you want to jump into it then? Um, have you got something to start yep. off like a uh, like a meddling album or something? Maybe. Yeah, I've got. Uh, in fact, this might this comes as a surprise even to me, but because when I first listened to this, I thought it was actually really good yeah but on repeat lessons it started to diminish quite a lot it's uh childish gambino three fifteen twenty. yeah i'm with you it, i'm with you on this one yeah the initial impression was really strong i thought like oh this has got a really nice sort of like it felt more co- cohesive than these other albums like i had a nice sort of uh a sort of a cons- an internal consistency and it had a nice sound to it that sort of carries through most of the album and i was like oh this is nice and chill but then when you actually sit and listen to it, yeah. there's nothing to it. Yeah. Like the the lyrics feel patchy and the music is stripped back to the point where it starts to be quite boring. Yeah, yeah. Um some songs are great. Uh I know everyone gives it shit uh because of the name, but Algorithm is is a good is a good track. And the closer uh was really decent, but I think so. It's basically the beginning and the end of the album are good, um, and feels like summer, whatever the hell it's called now, forty six, whatever. Yeah, that's good. But uh, the more I listen to the rest of it, the more I just genuinely started to get bored of it. Yeah, I had the same reaction. First listen, um, I thought it was good. You know, it was quite um, interesting. The production. Um, I think I think it sort of blindsides you the first time you listen to it. You think, oh, it's it's slightly esoteric, uh, experimental R and B, and then when you listen to it a second time, you go, actually, it's less experimental than I would have thought, and just like patchy. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah, the first time it's... you sort of give it graces, where you're like, oh well, all this sort of gaps and the uh, gaps in the music is is really about <laughs> something but i don't know yeah i it feels like it kind of like it got away with something because of the expectation that's been put on him yeah like everyone everyone thinks he's this big renaissance man like he's a very capable artist and he was making this musical decision for a reason yeah and then when you listen to it it's like Sure, yeah. On on initial listen, there is an internal logic. It feels like to the album for like behind the musical choices made. But yeah, like the more you dig into it, the more you realise that it's all just smoke and mirrors. Yeah, 
what it reminded me of was, do you remember that fucking uh, Gorillaz album made on an iPad in Damon Albarn's toilet? Yeah, fuck, aye, the fall. Yeah, yeah, it's just, you're right. just sort of like childish Gambino, just like he was have, you know, it, it was like between his starter and his main, and he was like, well, I could just make a song here. Um, <laughs> it's just, I don't know, yeah, it just felt a little skeletal, um, but not maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it felt skeletal. Um, not on purpose. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's that's fair. Yeah, it's definitely very superficial. Yeah, like doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Yeah, I wasn't. But no, I wasn't keen. That's that's pretty much the most negative thing I have to say about any of the stuff I listen to. Yeah. Um, everything else is good. Yeah, there was a like I I've seen it not get a lot of good reviews, it's got sort of meddling reviews but I thought it was slightly more interesting I quite liked mm. um, the new Grimes album um, okay. Miss Anthropocene I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll have got that wrong um, but it's sort of up front it's, it's our least interesting album Probably. Okay. Like I, I love Visions. Visions was like the best single pop album of the decade for me. Um, and this just doesn't have as many ideas on it. It seems very sort of tunnel vision, and it's it's it gets very samey. But when she's good, she's very good. Um, and hmm. even on a sort of middling. Um, non-essential Grimes album is slightly more interesting than uh, you know a typical sort of uh, electro pop album I guess um, it's it's definitely a okay. gloomier album than she's ever made um, and yeah I think the experimentation on this doesn't gel as well as on uh, visions or art angels. Uh, some of the singles are alright. Um, in fact, what was funny was uh, with the singles leading up to this album, um, Violence, um, I Fall Through the Earth, or whatever it was called, uh, and mm. some other ones, I was not keen on the singles, so I, I sort of went into it expecting it to expected not to like it particularly but actually I, I thought the singles improved uh, in the album as a whole uh, but even still it, it's it's sort of mild sauce uh, version of what she's done before uh, but it's it's okay. yeah basically a cut through the, it's it's like a three out of five okay. effectively it's, it's sort of it's like a eh. It's uh, I kind of feel like I I've fell so out of step with Grimes ever since Visions. Like I remember liking Visions a lot when it came out, and then I just never tried again. Yeah. With her, um, and like everyone loved that. What was it? We appreciate power. What was that album? That that was the single for this album, but that oh, right. but that isn't on the album. <laughs> that's, okay. that's on like the extended bonus cuts on the album so mm. if like it's on I think you can certainly I, I would listen to the bonus the bonus tracks up to that uh, and it's a much more fuller album um, but yeah if, if you're just going on the non-bonus tracks it's it's, it's just mm. missing something it's like actually it's like um, the Childish Gambino album in that way that it's it is missing a This Is America. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like it's like that's such yeah. a, that's such a good song and everybody loves it for the obvious <laughs> reasons because sometimes something's great just because it's great. Um, mm. and it's missing something like that. Like if the Childish Gambino album had that in its track listing, you'd be like, okay, it anchors it. And I think that would have been the same if she'd used "We We Appreciate Power" 
I think I might as well talk about the Haru Namuri uh, mini album then. Okay. Haru Haru Namuri Love Theism. Uh, it's again, it's like kind of uh, she's almost like the Japanese Grimes, yep. maybe. She's like got that kind of mad mix of influences and kind of feels like you could almost expect her to go in any direction musically. Yeah. Um, and this album is drastically different from uh, the last one that she put out, Haru Toshura or whatever it was called. Um, from a like few years ago, yeah. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a couple of years ago now, yeah. Um, because it opens up with like bells and marching drums. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, but it kind of it sets a tone because she's really going in directions here that I wasn't expecting of her. And it sounds really good. And a lot of the songs are very big and grandiose sounding. And then she goes back to like maybe more traditionally like kind of rocky kind of, you know, that staccato delivery thing that she's good right, at. Right. Like the kind of rapping almost. Yeah. And the electronica and stuff like that. So it's a lovely mix of things. Um that makes up like a little 25 minute little album it's like pretty much no flab on it at all cool. it's like probably it isn't my album of the month for a for a reason but it is pretty much just like it's such an easy listen that you have to check it out because it's just it won't take up much of your time either uh-huh, uh-huh. um yeah, but uh i'll need to check yeah, it I'll i thought need, it was hmm. i'll need to check it out good. yeah i liked i did like that i think I think, I can't remember now, it might have been on my list of, of my initial list for best albums of 2018. I think she might have been floating in mm. there, maybe. Um, I don't remember. But yeah, I'll, I'll need to check it out. Yeah, I really like that last one. It's cool. Um, what have I got to talk about? Um, I've, I've, had a, I've had a request from a, a viewer of the show. Uh, okay. a friend of mine, uh, Paul McDaniel. Uh, he uh, okay. this, this did come out, I think, at the beginning of February. He, he said, I think this was quite good. Uh, would you listen to it? It is the new album by Team Impa- Impala. Team Impala. Okay. Um, called The Slow Rush. Um, I, I'd heard their name before. If I'm honest, I'd never really listened to them. Um, in fact, I definitely hadn't ever listened to them. Um, Team and Parlor, I guess it's sort of like neo psychedelica, sort of slightly folky pop music. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's pretty cool. It's all right. Um, it's it's not you know it's not gonna uh, challenge you musically, um, <laughs> but it's it's just good um, cheesy. Fucking pop music. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. It's all right. Uh, won't won't that won't that infuriate the the Team Impala purists out there? Because I'm pretty sure they think of Team Impala as quite uh, dense and challenging. I'm pretty sure people think Team Impala is like an artiste. Well, I had a, yeah, I, like I looked back at the the discography, and I think there's one, um, not the last one prior to this, but like the one before that. That's like every like all the or the sort of uh, the guitar, the the journalists, music journalists that still mm-hmm. exclusively listen to guitar music, or were like, oh, it's the best album, <laughs> of the, you know, it's the best album <laughs> in the last ten years. Um, and it's 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 whatever that album is. The fucking the album covers <laughs> like a ball and a fucking yeah, you know, I know, ah, you know that one, right? Um, yeah, that that <laughs> is better than this one. Um, but it's just like you know, it's like. It's like um, the flaming lips or something, you know. It's like the flaming yeah. lips, but they don't have that weird old guy that's into Miley Cyrus. So it's like a less, <laughs> it's like a less creepy fucking. <laughs> you get less of a creepy predator vibe from Tame and Paula <laughs> than you do Flaming Lips. Uh, and I, I like that. Yeah, I like that one or two Flaming Lips albums, but he's he's fucking weird these days. No. Uh, whatever he, whatever his name is, Wayne fucking Wayne Beast or whatever. He's, no, it's just it does some <laughs> there's some weird stuff going on with him and that Miley Cyrus. It's just a bit. Uh. But anyway, um, <laughs> rant aside, 
Uh, yeah, Team Impala. It's pretty cool. It's all right. It's one of those that I know for a fact. I know there are there are Team Impala zealots out there. I actually when when I went to college, people were mad. These kids, these like eighteen year olds, were mad into Team Impala, and I was like. I thought it used to be pronounced Tammy Impala because I thought it was like kind of like Spanish or something. Ta- Tammy Impala. But it's Team Impala and it, apparently Impala is like a car or something maybe or a, a, an animal. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's a deer type thing. It's like a gazelle sort of thing, isn't it? Okay. And that, that, but, uh, that held me back from them as well. Like, <laughs> you know, like, do I want to listen to... A band called Team Impala. You're already sort of setting yourself up for. <laughs> it's it's like it's not a not a good name. It's it's, it's not a good it's name. Not a good name. Um, it's like it's like they're not they're not bad. They're not a bad band. But it's mm. like why would you call your band Team Impala? It's like or with a rock band, what are you going to call yourself? cold play oh for fuck's sake <laughs> you know even even <laughs> no just i mean there's lots of bad band names out of there we might even cover yeah. some of them in this episode uh code orange do you have any strong feelings about code orange underneath i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> but i didn't i okay i just didn't get it um yeah i don't know i'd I'd seen it written up on all the metal sites. It's like, oh, this is a great bit of metal, and I just, I got to say, I didn't get it. Um, maybe, maybe you can explain what it sort of sounds like because I couldn't. Well, I have. A, I already know why you don't like it. Uh-huh. Uh I can already explain to you why you probably didn't like it, and it's because it sounds exactly like. Uh, basically, if someone chopped up and fucked around with some 2000s industrial metal a la Static X. Yeah, yeah. So, basically, a lot of the tracks, especially one called Last Ones Left, sounds so uncannily like Static X songs, it's unreal. Fuck. So, I loved it because it sounds like Static X and I like that trashy 2000s industrial metal sound. Uh-huh. Um, and basically, all they did was they went... Let's make that. But put, and a, then, put a lassie uh, on it. Yeah. And also just uh, glitch it out and like do a little bit of math metal breakdowns here and there to just to spice things up a wee bit. Yeah. Um, it's basically completely arbitrary where they throw the breakdowns in, it feels. Um, they just have no rhyme or reason Aye. to how they construct the songs, it feels. That's, that's how but I felt. I found myself kind of enjoying it regardless, even though it is kind of obnoxious and annoying in places. Yeah. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't love it, but it evoked some some nice feelings in me because it was very, it reminded me a lot of the good old days with Static X and insert other 2000s industrial metal band name here. Uh, All I know is that it has some nice little, even the skipping and the spasmy stuff is kind of as obnoxious as it can be for certain things like it. I think it's in Sulphur Surrounding is the big single uh-huh. I think it kind of works for it uh, because it actually does that one at least has like bits of melody and then there's a definite clear point for the breakdown to happen yeah. and it works there but yeah in the rest of the tracks it, it feels quite arbitrary I, I just didn't it didn't move me in any way I just sort of it didn't annoy me but it just sort of <laughs> felt sort of yeah, like a like a total throwback to stuff stuff that I didn't like at the time, and and like you say with the breakdowns, I just why is it at this point? Why is it that there was no sort of rhyme and reason? It was it just sort of felt like like metal by algorithm, you know? Yeah, like and some AI has has <laughs> has downloaded all the Static X albums. Um, and and decided let's put out the most annoying version of that. Or the, it's actually a very concise way to describe it. The, the mild, the mildest annoyance. Um, not like you know, it's not the worst thing I've listened to on this channel. Is still that Static X album for the book club. Um, <laughs> I think. Right? Did I hate anything more than that? 
I don't think so. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not as bad <laughs> as that, but uh, yeah. But yeah, if you want some mathy stuff done right, you could listen to Horse Lords, the common task. Hey, yes, I did like this one. Uh, that was so. It's such a weird. I guess it's sort of glitchy post rock. Uh, it's instrumental music, um, mm-hmm. and it's weird. It is really weird. It's sort of. It's like a crowdy jazz math rock. Yeah, like, yeah. It's got like crowdy breakdowns and like sort of like long kind of like long flows and stuff like that but then it can go into these like really weird staccato things like i didn't i didn't give it too many lessons i think i listened to it like two times mo- at the most yeah. and i don't really think i took it in the second time but it was an interesting album and i knew that you would like this one i, I like this one it's officially the only record i can think of with bagpipes on it that i like um <laughs> uh they'll, they'll kick me out of scotland for that um, he's got blue, white, and red flowers, pure, <laughs> purely accidentally, uh, and he doesn't like he doesn't like uh, bagpipes. Do, 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 do any? Here's my question to you, the viewer, and you, John. Does any rational Scottish person like the bagpipes? It's all about context for me because on their own bagpipes are horrendous yeah like they don't work as a as an instrument on their own at all but buried in a mix with other things i think it works really really well yeah. like i am of course a very old school corn fan and i think he actually does use bagpipes right sometimes very rarely but it does happen and uh weirdly enough uh, there's a Scottish wrestler right now called Drew McIntyre, that... and his theme song has like heavy metal bagpipes. Okay, it's like basically imagine like a pipe band, like a marching band, but it was like eight times crunchier, and it, it, it's amazing. It's an amazing theme song. A, a, a pipe, um, a pipe band that's crunchy. Okay, um... yeah, like a big fucking. <laughs> and it's got the bagpipes okay. going over it and stuff like that. All right. It actually sounds cool as hell, but it's like very, very, very rare instances of bagpipes actually being good. Oh. And I would I would actually want to meet the person who just likes listening to bagpipe music on its own, because I think they might be crazy. I once... Uh, were you at this gig? <laughs> <laughs> um, Public Enemy came out and Flavor Flav had a... Had a pair of bagpipes that's the only time unfortunately I've, i was at that game. the only time i've i've enjoyed bagpipes just because it was so stupid um no you know what you know what i'll, I'll ask bagpipes are all right there you go i can stay in scotland <laughs> uh actually i did i did i did once many years ago i i filmed uh, uh bags of rock which is like a uh, bagpipe band that did like metal covers and stuff. That was actually good fun. So I, I rena- yeah, I can imagine they can be implemented well when people know what they're doing. But just someone playing fucking Flower of Scotland or whatever with the bagpipes on their own, standing in a street corner, makes me want to go up and kick them right it's, in the bag. It's because that flat that we shared was in the Chukta Triangle. Oh, Christ, um, yeah. <laughs> and every fucking Friday and Saturday. Uh, down Argyll Street. Um, <laughs> shite. Um, get their get their bagpipe music on. Get out in the streets, have a big fight, go back in, and just go back to drinking. Just all these all these chucked to accents. Just you've ruined this trip to the big city, Shona. You know, just like oh, ev- <laughs> every weekend with bagpipe music coming out. <laughs> but aye, uh, um, yeah, a horse lords was good. I quite enjoyed it. Um, it's it's one that you wouldn't play your mum, <laughs> although she does have the time at the moment because she's in lockdown. You you could play this to your mum and go, "Mum, you will get into this at some point." <laughs> On a long enough timeline, everyone gets into horse. Exactly, lots. exactly. Uh, but yes, it's just weird experimental instrumental music, and it's uh, it's good fun. Um, speaking of weird instrument, mostly instrumental music. 
called uh, Before the Age of Mirrors, and that's by Raspberry Bulbs. And it's just like okay. hellish, fucking nasty punk music, just like real scuzzy, <laughs> nasty. The music feels woozy and like drunk and damaged, and it like will lunge at you occasionally. So it, it feels like a pretty unhinged record. Uh, and it, the experience of listening to it is like um, being on a ferry that's being rocked side to side by some tough waves, and you're just like, am I gonna get, am I gonna go under with this, or am I gonna make it to the other side? It's it's a difficult lesson, uh, but it's really interesting. It's really cool. I'm thinking this this one is like the antithesis to what you've just spoke about um it's the weekend after all okay yeah um it's basically the exact opposite of drunken harsh brutal woozy punk it's very easy listening pop r&b bangers one after the other oh it's great until the album ends it's great i loved it it's good fun (laughs) It's not ambitious uh, like Starboy was. Starboy is a very ambitious album, but I think it, yeah. as great as it can be in places, it sort of falls flat a little bit because it's maybe not. It's he's not capable of making something as big and as grandiose as he maybe wanted to with Starboy. Aye. But some of the some of his greatest stuff comes for that. It's like that one song he did with Daft Punk. I feel it coming is like the best thing Daft Punk have done since the nineties. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I'd go with that. Uh, like, genuinely, they feel like they've just been fucking about <laughs> for a long, long time, and I don't care about what Daft Punk do. And that was a really, really that was a nice wee feature, and it worked really well. Um, but this album, less complicated, but it's just all business. Like, it's just it is exactly what you want right now because there's pretty much no thinking involved. Yeah, it's just sheer. It's just music that you can just nod along to dance along to and you don't have to think about it even a little bit yeah it's um, it's the album because his that, lyrics are not great yeah they're a bit uh they're a bit cheese uh but it's really good it's, <laughs> it's a good album it's it's the album that immediately upon listening to it obliterated um the childish gambino one for me I think they they were out around about the same time, so I think I'd done the Childish Gambino one, and then the next day listened to this one, I was just like, fuck, that's like (laughs) everything that a Childish Gambino album's trying to do, but succeeds, you know, it's it's sort of weird esoteric R&B, but the production's much better... Um, it's more interesting and it, can, it actually hooks you. I, I, yeah, I really liked it. Um, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's hard to fault uh, like a single real moment on the album. It sort of feels so consistent and so enjoyable because it is just very... The bar is very low with it. It's like it's very easy entry stuff. It's just pop R&B at its best. Yeah. But I think that's as a result, that's why it's not my album of the month. Yeah. Because it's just a little bit too like pappy it's like a little bit too mushy yeah a little pappy um yeah like need something to get my teeth into a little bit more just yep. a tiny i'd like a little kick that notch up one more time i think exactly and it would have been something spectacular yeah and this sort of same sort of wheelhouse rap fiera or r-a-p fiera uh, with purple moonlight okay. pages, uh, it's a bit of weird jazzy hip hop, uh, but it's banging. It's really good. It's worth checking out. And okay. the most recent sort of uh, weirdo jazz record um, is Shabaka and the Ancestors, and that is "We Are Sent Here by History," which is another sort of modern. Uh, another great uh, English or, or yeah, London centric uh, jazz band, um, like Sons of Kemet or um, the Comets Coming. This is really propulsive and it's got a real great rhythm section. It just drives it forward. This one is more sort of indebted to like um, African sort of roots music and. 
it's like sort of Afro futurist. It's worth, it's worth a listen. Another couple of albums that were really good uh, this month. I really liked. There was an album by Sega Bodega called Salvador, and this is sort of a really great mix of uh, sort of R and B and rap and sort of UK bass music and electronica, and it's it's sort of like emotionally damaged sort of electro music, so like a sort of Crystal Castles, but it's harder on the R and B and and rap. Um, it's really uh, it goes a mile a minute, and it's it's gloomy, and it's you know it's 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 a raw album. Some of it's quite emotionally intense and brutal, um, but it's sort of banger after banger after banger. If you just want a big, huge sounding electro album, uh, this is the one to go for this uh, at this month. Uh, and my second favourite album of the month was um, Heavy Light by US Girls, which is sort of really great experimental rock and pop. Uh, it's, it's sort of it's some new cuts and some older material from her uh, that she's repurposed. And it's got a real richness of sound, and it's just, it's really cool. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, so I would recommend all of those uh, records as well. But yeah, so I guess it's just album of the month. Sweet. Um, this, uh, my one kind of surprised me a bit because uh, I remember texting you actually not even not even that long ago it's not even a full week ago uh and i was talking about the fact that i haven't gotten around to listening to this album yet or albums yeah and i was scared about how big they are it's nine inch nails ghosts five and six all right um are my albums of the month albums plural because they're yeah they're two very expansive gigantic ambient albums uh, in the Ghost series, that they released Ghosts one through four in two thousand and eight. All right. Um, and it was just that it was like a series of EPs that they released for free that were just all ambient, and it was like his first real attempt to break into that sort of ambient sound, which is sort of done and with his soundtrack always... stuff now, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He clearly like turned his hand to that around that era, and it's really paid off for him. He's very good at that. He's very good at that now. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of his stuff can be quite inoffensive, though, when he's doing soundtrack. Like, it kind of just... It genuinely does blend into the background, and it just sort of doesn't feel significant. Yeah. Um, Whereas, like, the ghost stuff was... uh, Just meant to stand on its own merit. And those first four were good. I will remember liking them, but I haven't really listened to them since 2008. Yeah. Um, And here we are, 12 years later, he's released some more in this series and he released them for free um the first one ghost five is subtitled together and it's 70 minutes long all right and number six locusts is 80 minutes long they're absolutely giant um the but because it's ambient it doesn't feel like it overstays its welcome you know full well from a history of apex twin albums and whatnot that Sometimes you'll listen to uh, an ambient uh, album and it's like a hundred minutes long and you're like, that's totally fine. Yeah. And you yeah. won't think twice about it. <laughs> you won't care. Um, so like when I listened to this, when I started listening to it, I didn't have high hopes because I was like, I remember liking Ghosts 1 through 4, but it didn't blow me away. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's maybe just the overall mood and the sensation of like closed offness that we're all feeling just now yeah but there was something very very soothing about these albums they felt like a lot of ambient stuff can just come across as innocuous and kind of cold yeah and pointless almost like meandering but these albums felt like they actually made perfect sense and they felt very warm 
and like there is a bit of diversity in them because like it kind of especially the first one uh together is the one i listen to the most and and when i say most i managed to get through it twice uh-huh. um because they're just that big it's just it's a bit of an undertaking every time but um there's a song on it called uh your touch and it's genuinely beautiful like there's like i can't really put it in any other way it's like one of the few ambient tracks especially from like nine inch nails that i would say that they've made something genuinely beautiful here all right okay. um which kind of took me aback it's not at all what i want or expect from nine inch nails but it's exactly what i needed yeah yeah um which was nice it was a pleasant surprise uh, and then it like together closes with still right here and it's got this big like sort of floaty sort of grand ambient feeling and then it sort of like segues into this glitchy noise and then like straight back into it feels like you go on a wee journey with him yeah it's nice um definitely a lot more to it than just bog standard boring sort of plodding ambient stuff cool and yeah it was genuinely surprising locusts i only listened to once but again it was a continuation of that sound it's like ambient with a little bit more meat on its bones oh, right, it was okay. good and very sort of relaxing just became like a, a nice thing to really tune myself into and sort of helps with that feeling of remoteness uh-huh uh-huh cool oh well that sounds interesting i'll need to give it a listen uh i've i never kept up to date with nine inch nails after like with teeth i think was the last one that i remember properly listening to uh and mm. digging when they went which is odd for me because I do love sort of Aphex Twin and Square Push and all these sorts of stunt things. Yeah. Uh, when they went more instrumental, I haven't really kept up to date with them, and I I haven't really kept up to date with their film work either. Uh, but hmm. yeah, sounds interesting. I'll give it a listen. Um, cool. Well, it's sort of similar. My album of the month is the new one from Nicholas Jar. Um, and it's called Senizaz. I probably I I always mispronounce every album title, but I think that's how it is. <laughs> and this is sort of uh, Nicholas Jar. This is his second release of the year, first under his own name. Um, he's a sort of dance music producer, uh, electronic producer, um, and this is sort of his most introspective and sort of. Um, existential record, I guess. It's it's sort of got this really gloomy, atmospheric quality to it, and it's a mix of sort of sort of house music or sort of quite ethereal, ghostly, sort of almost witch house, and and then just like these slabs of jazz just bubble up to the surface. Um, it's both the quietest and the loudest record that you can imagine. Um, and it's got a real sort of cool hallucinatory quality to it. It's like you put it on mm. and then there's these sudden shifts in tone and rhythm. Um, sort of almost like you with house music and this sort of thing, you, you sort of get into a groove and you expect a track to go a certain way, whereas this does not do that. It's... It, really takes these sort of strange left field um paths and uh yeah it's just great there's there's all this sort of there's all this sort of weird chanting on the record so it feels like it's almost being like you're in a sort of weird service almost like weird sort of church like it's almost like when we went to see when people describe going to see Sun, you know, it's almost like a sort of you're in a big weird church sort <laughs> of environment. It's it's got yeah. it's got a sort of droney quality to it that sort of you know like the best uh, sort of stoner metal or or doom metal or drone metal that has that sort of great quality of it. It will be on in the background and then it'll take a. Uh, shift somehow in the music and it's like whoa it re- everything sort of comes into focus it has that sort of quality to it it's not dro- it's not drony uh it's it's quite 
although it's quite gloomy, it's it's actually something you could probably dance to. Um, mm. But it does have that sort of gear shift uh, changes that I like. Uh, so yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's a really cool record. So yeah, so and uh, and then I get that's... I guess that's us into the the book club <laughs> or the bot club. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll get into this. Uh, this record then it's primal scream with exterminator from 2000 so it's it's exactly 20 years old yeah it's very much a product of its of the time it was released um it has a weird weird palette of of uh influences and sounds going on in it that like it makes perfect sense yeah. why why you like it <laughs> Um, and it makes perfect sense that it's like, this is kind of their sleeper, like the one that people sleep on, but it's actually like maybe one of their best records. I, I would say it's their um, best record, I would, yeah. Because hands down, it's absolutely not what I would expect from Primal Scream, and I absolutely loved it. Um, oh, cool, okay. It's extremely easy to listen to, uh... Because it, it ticks a lot of the boxes of shit that I like, especially from around that era. It had like it had that big beat influence because yep. there's like Chemical Brothers producing and stuff like that, and you can hear that. But it also has like that kind of there's parts in the album I can't remember which one it is. I think Keep Your Dreams uh, has like '90s Smashing Pumpkins vibes. Yeah, yeah. It has there's like little moments there where it sounds so much like. Uh, that album that uh, Smashing Pumpkins did, that it was like a little bit more dreamy. Oh like, yeah, uh, yeah. But it had e- elect- electronic influence all over, and the, the the guitar was a little bit harsher, Ex Machina or whatever it was called. I can't remember what the hell it was called, but it has that sort of vibe to it that I instantly sort of gravitated towards. And absolutely, there's moments on this album where I'm like, okay, so this is where Kasabian got their sound. Oh, yeah, 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 like, definitely. Kasabian literally just ripped this album off. Aye, aye. <laughs> They're just copying it. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, uh, I can do a little bit of a track-by-track thing. Cool, yeah. If you want. Yeah, no, um, that, yeah, let's go for it. So, Kill All Hippies, uh, <laughs> strong opener. The big beat influence and sort of crowdy marching swagger uh, is like right there up front, like kind of just grabs you right away because it's got that sort of really insistent rhythm section that just gets you hooked and that pretty much plays out throughout the whole album that, that, except for a that, couple of tracks. That bass is just so thick. Oh yeah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's dirty and scuzzy and fuzzed out to hell and it's like a majority of the tracks have that all over it and it never gets tiresome. Like, I never get tired of just how amazing the drumming and bass sound is throughout. Um, Because, like, straight into Accelerator, pretty much the exact same. (laughs) Screeching instrumentation and big shouty gang vocals and distorted guitar solo in the the third, uh, the third, the final third. Um... I just fuck it. It's just an ass kicking song. It's just like you will absolutely get battered in the pit to it. Yeah. Um, Exterminator has farty bass and screeching synth undercurrent. Late nineties industrial dance vibes all over it. Um, Swastika eyes. It's just a club banger. Oh, uh, it's so good. And yeah. At that, well, sorry, I should I should uh, point out Swastika eyes. The Jags Cooner mix. Um, is a, just a straight up club banger and it really just starts to sink into uh, to my brain at that point just how few lyrics there are on the album yeah, there's like yeah. maybe a couple of lines and they just get repeated a bunch but it's not a negative, it totally works for the album and like sort of make sure that you're focusing more on the instrumentation yeah. which is great because that's it's real, that's it's strong point I think that's where um, I, I like this album over all the other Primal Scream albums. Like, there's a few good albums outside of us. Um, Scoomadelic is the obvious one, um, but this mm. is definitely the the least amount of vocals you get from Bobby Gillespie, which, <laughs> like, he puts his heart and soul into it. But Bobby is mm. not a singer, really. No, um, he really isn't. And so there's less of that sort of 
Mick Jagger stones sort of fucking shite that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so that's probably why I loved it uh, out of everything they've done. Yeah. Very minimalistic approach to the vocals and stuff and like just sort of treating it more like a like another layer in the mix. Yeah. Like just another instrument in the mix, basically. Um, adding to that sort of the fierce feeling of the album where it's like more politically and personally driven. Yeah. So it's like it's not there he's not talking in like platitudes like when he's crooning. He's just shouting and everyone's having a big shout about stuff that matters yeah. kind of thing. Um then it moves on to Pills. Which is actually his e. best folk best uh best yeah. vocals on it where he starts screaming fuck uh you know <laughs> just yeah. at the end. It's just so great. Yeah. It's I like you can feel the you can feel he actually is impassioned in it. It just it works. His vocals can work when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah, especially because like the whole track is so bizarre. It genuinely does feel like someone falling apart because it is just like uh, I've got written in my notes that it sounds like a horror core track. It's like basically a preamble for that hip hop sound of like that horror core hip hop sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It kind of it laid some groundwork for that because it has this weird plodding like pounding like uh instrumental but it's like it's not too fast and it's not too insistent it's just got this really nice sort of moody <laughs> moody as fuck's like almost hip-hop vibe which made it sound like a horrorcore track yeah yeah um blood money frantic driven drums big weird distorted audio loops all over it and um, given give uh, gives ways to ho- uh, gives way to horns and this big fuzzy bass line as per usual and uh, there's a, there's a weird experimental jazz element to this song <laughs> that sort of just yeah. comes out of nowhere. Yeah, uh, like I didn't see this this song on the album at all, and it really does drive home just how weirdly eclectic the sound is in this album. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really good. Keep your dreams. Uh, that's the smashing pumpkiny kind of vibed one. It's very melodic compared to everything else on the album. Yeah, uh, it's a nice wee break from all the high energy big fucking crunchy fuzzy ones um very warm organ sound and like little drum loops just understated and dreamy and pleasant um insect royalty big chunky hip-hop type beat got a lot of swagger uh but maybe the least musically interesting of the of the whole album like it just sort of feels a bit one note yeah maybe yeah not yeah not terrible, but it's sort of the I'd say maybe the shallowest track on the album. It's got the best um, named so it's the best named song on the album. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's got like um little buzz like distorted vocals, so it makes it sound like someone is an insect royalty. It actually has like insect <laughs> voice on it. Just to make sure it sort of plays into the theme of the song, you know. It's not a subtle um, album. <laughs> Uh, MBV Orchestra, if they move, kill them. Nice layers of percussion and horns uh, powering through on the track, uh, along with this like, sort of weird persistent psychedelic guitar. Um, it gets crunchier and punchier over time, and it's got these big bursts of distortion, uh, like sort of guitar noodling. Um, eventually, it's just this big discordant like cacophony. <laughs> Uh, intercut with horns it's it's a testament to how good the production is because on this song it very easily could have just become muddy yeah. and it's just impossible to make anything out but and nothing gets lost in the mix you can hear each instrument Yeah, like at no point does it ever feel like murky it's very clear but not not to the point where it actually just sounds too clean and boring. Uh-huh. It's like it does a nice, there's a nice bit of attitude and whatnot to the production of a, a bit of muck in it, but you can hear everything, which is nice. Uh-huh. Um, Swastika Eyes, Chemical Brothers mix. It's just faster and more nineties dance sounding. Uh, it doesn't really need to be there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not as good as the other one. No, um, no. Shoot speed, kill light. Uh, traditional psychedelic kraut rock style anthem to close out the album and it's again it's got this amazing sort of layering of synth and distorted guitar and driving rhythm section and everything's crystal clear and you can hear it all and it just ends a very good experience perfectly well um 
sort of more in the vein of what I would expect from Primal Scream. Yeah. But it's actually better than I would expect from them. Yes, yeah. Uh, because it has that sort of more psychedelic rock sound. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, Roundly enjoyed it a great deal. You know, I think last month or in the last episode, I'd I I'd thought I need to pick something that is, you know, from my own childhood that I heard as a kid. Um, so I thought this has to be it, and it has everything that I would then. The referencing on a on the album is great because it's almost like taking the best bits of Gang of Four, Can. Uh, you know, all these sort of weird post-punk influences, and then after that, you're like, well, I can go and have a look at all the things that have influenced it. So, yeah, it's great. I like yeah. it. It's a good album. Uh, and I'm, uh, I thought if there's, if there's one Primal Scream album that you would get and love, I think it's it's that one. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, you gave me uh, Lateralis by Tool. Uh, and I had a, I went on a bit of a journey with this album. Um, <laughs> I, I, this won't come as a surprise to you because I, I think uh, we went to JPEG Mafia and I got a little drunk and I maybe told you slightly that I, I appreciated <laughs> the album more than I thought. Uh, but yeah, so the my the confession I have to make is that um, as as a metalhead. Uh, I would I would say I love a lot of metal, but I've never really loved progressive metal. Uh, mm. I like I like prog rock and I like uh, kraut rock uh, and that's sort of, those sorts of bands in the, in the seventies. But progressive metal never did it for me. You know, bands like um, Tool previously, um, Dream Theater and Opeth, uh, and even less metally, but like uh, the Mars Volta. Uh, what would happen was I would listen to the records and I would appreciate the sort of technical ability, but mostly the music would leave me cold. Um, I think with progressive metal, I felt a sort of there's a there's sort of a, an aloofness to it, a, a sort of distancing between myself and, and the the music. Uh, you know, it's almost like I'm getting played at instead of this is a record that I'm I'm vibing with. Um, <laughs> and and that's sort of how I felt with uh, Feed Inoculum from last year. Like I appreciated the sort of technical abilities. Uh, and the playing on it, but it just left me cold. Uh, now that album is good, but it just didn't have the sort of gut punch that I now realise that is a that's a prerequisite for my love of metal. It's got a, the metal that I love. I think has to sort of grab me by the throat slightly, I, and I think progressive metal's slightly uh, more cerebral. I guess it guess it works on a different way. Um so I don't really have an ear for it. And the first time I listened to this lateralis, uh, I didn't get it actually. Um when when the first song came on The Grudge, um I can't remember what this is a reference to, but I, in my head it's either South Park or Beavis and Butthead. But do you know the you know, there's like some sort of band playing and the guy goes, get ready for this crunchy groove. <laughs> you know, I can't, is that South Park? It probably... I'm not sure. It's, it sounds like it's a, a South Park line. But I had that line run through my head when that was first playing. It was like, oh no, I don't know if I'm going to be into this. <laughs> and it is a crunchy groove, don't get me wrong. It's it's a cr- <laughs> and, and it's, it's a good crunchy groove. But I... I sort of thought with that first song, like, oh no, I'm not going to be into this. And actually, I wasn't really into the album. Like, I, I was appreciating it until we got to Ticks and Leeches. Uh, mm-hmm. And then something just clicked in my head. It was like a switch, almost. And then I <laughs> I got it. Like, the drumming on that is f- ferocious. It's just so... <laughs> It was like 
right, now we've got into the thrash metal of it. Um, and I was like, right, I'm into this now. And then actually, the the songs after that, on my first listen, uh, Lateralis, uh, Disposition, Triad, and then whatever that last track is called, um, they all just were great. It suddenly somehow got... <laughs> I somehow got it. It was like Tix and Leeches was the... Um, the catalyst for appreciating yeah. the album. And then once I got it, I, I re-listened to it and I re-listened to it again. And then I found that all the tracks that I had ap- only appreciated previously, I then suddenly got, I was like, right, I get why this is so heralded um, <laughs> in the metal community. I, I, it just, it just, I needed a, the song to just turn something in my head, and then I was like, right, this is mm. actually great. So I, I went back and I re-listened to all the other songs. Uh, the Grudge, it's a crunchy groove, but it's just, <laughs> the playing in it is just so good, and it just, it's it's almost, it's almost too subtle, the instrumentation. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's like you don't initially get, or at least I didn't initially get what they were doing the first time. It's like it's just sort of like the first time I listened to it, I just I had maybe I just went in with a bad attitude, and I was I was like, this is just <laughs> going to be like sort of, you know, sort of progressive metal, just sort of noodly doesn't really go to anything but each of the tracks really build and they go down sort of weird tangents and then they always loop round and it's yeah just phenomenally great album um it took me um a while to get into it on first listen but i really love it it's great um it's it's miles Miles better than Fear and Oculum. I, I would have to say I've not listened. Yeah. I've not listened to the other albums, but I'd be really un- interested in listening to what is that? A thousand eyes. Uh, uh, ten thousand ten, days. Ten thousand days. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll. Yeah, I'm. I'm a real tool mark now, or at least a latter. <laughs> uh, at least a, a latter Alice mark. It's fucking great. <laughs> it's so good. Um. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I, I'm really, I'm really happy I had the chance to listen to it, and I actually had this weird journey with the album. Um, but yeah, I can, I can see why it's a classic, and I would happily listen to anything on this <laughs> album uh, again on multiple occasions in the future. Um, but it's got to be ticks and leeches for me that. Just something <laughs> pushed my buttons, and that's my track. That's my jam. That's I, I imagine tool heads all have their tool jam. That's mine. I love it. It's fucking great. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. It's good. I think that, that's very, very. I'm very thankful that it is like it's one of those albums that sort of does have. Like it's it's got like an entry level almost. Yeah. Like it does need that little bit of like something opens up all of a sudden and and it sort of it it's almost like you breathe it in. Yeah. And you're you take it straight to the head kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's great because it is like it is absolutely as much as I liked Fear Inoculum. It's a different kind of good. Yeah. Like this is this is artfully done prog metal with like all sorts of different and there's there's elements that they thought of deeply when it came to fear and oculum yeah. but with this one there was like all sorts of different things going on it like song structures being based around the fibonacci sequence and yeah. sampled stuff for the uh, uh the instrumental tracks coming from like weird weird sources and like like that last track that one that no one can pronounce. Yeah, I'll have Fe- a I'll have a go. Fear D O something like that. Uh, 
I, I think it's got something to do with occultism. It's like an occult language. Aye. I have absolutely no idea where it's from or who made it, but all I know is that it's an occult link and that's just so tool yeah. from the 2000s. Um, but yeah, like, aye, it's, it's on another level, this album, oh, and great. I'm glad you like it's, it. It's cause, really good. Because uh... it's, uh, it's sometimes the best stuff is hard to love. Okay, so on the flip side uh, of progressive metal, the opposite side of the coin is uh, post-punk revival. Okay. Uh, it's just some good old-fashioned, straight-up, mid-2000s indie rock. Uh-huh. Um, which you were never a big, big fan of. I, I, and... I liked Franz Ferdinand. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I sort of already liked Public Image Limited and, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Can and these sorts of bands that they were sort of aping. Uh, and Gang yeah. of Four, but yeah, you know, like yeah. Joy Division, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, the better versions of all of these bands, yeah, basically, and the Fall um, and stuff, yeah. But every now and then, there are some albums back from the heyday uh, yeah. of that sort of era of music that I was big into, and Darren was big into. That I kind of feel like some of it deserves more attention, or at least it, to be revisited, because. I think a lot of this stuff kind of went under the radar for everyone that wasn't British. Yeah. Because, like, a lot of this post-punk revival stuff came directly from England. Yeah. Um, There was a lot of English and Scottish bands, mostly English, uh, that were, like, really making some decent indie rock stuff. Uh Uh-huh. And one of the bands uh, that I think not a lot of people got into was The Young Knives with Voices of Animals and Men. Okay. This is the first actual full-length Young Knives album. Um, and me and Darren were absolutely fucking obsessed with it for many years. Okay. It's got pretty much just... There's some little instrumental tracks on it, but for the most part, it's just one daft, super angular indie rock banger after another. Cool. All right. Uh, with... The vocalist, the vocalist has a very distinct sound. I'd say he's got a very distinct voice that sort of separates them from the more, I don't know, the humdrummy kind of navel gazy sound of indie at the time. Okay, uh, there were some people out there like the the Cooks and oh yeah, not the uh, it was it I was the Cooks and like uh, the Pigeon Detectives and Hard Fi and that sort of stuff that had either regional accents that were obnoxious or just really bland singing voices yeah, yeah and this guy has a little bit of a an edge to him he can even like sort of belts it out and he's got a bit of rasp in his voice it sounds kind of nice yeah um and one of the best uh gig stories i ever had was me and darren went to go and see the young knives live in king tuts and we got there uh, and we thought that the gig had at least opened so we just started walking up the stairs in King Tut's and no one stopped us. And we walked up to the, the, the main uh, performance area in King Tut's uh-huh. and the young knives were just sitting there with their like road manager eating their dinner. And they looked at us and we looked at them and then we went back down the stairs. <laughs> it was really weird because no one stopped us from going up at all and we just barged in on this band having their dinner before the gig. Do you remember what they um, were eating? So... No, no, I don't remember. It looked like it was just a takeaway, though. Fair like, enough. just something simple. But, yeah, they were eating, and they looked confused at the fact we were there, so we just excused ourselves and went back down for a drink. Well, fair enough. Um, because that's how much of a shambles King Tut's is. People say it's one of the best venues in Glasgow. It's actually shite. Um, um, we definitely saw some terrible gigs in there. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, uh, Rolo Tomasi was shite there. A Wilhelm Scream was shite there. Plan B was shite there. Why? Oh, and it's no the band's fault. The bands try their best, but the the kind of people that go to King Tut's and the kind of venue that King Tut's is somehow just makes these performances shite. That's that's John's it's... hot take there. Um, <laughs> they'll, they'll throw me out of Scotland for hating bagpipes, but they'll throw John out of Glasgow for hating <laughs> King Tut's. Just slaughtering the sacred cows to this episode. <laughs> the Barrowlands is better and St. Luke's is better. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, totally. S- SWG3 is way better. Do you remember live music, kids? Uh, <laughs> used to be able to go out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. music. God, what a time. Oh, fuck. At least JPEG Mafia got to be our last gig for a while. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, <laughs> cool. All right, Young Knives. Uh, cool, I'll give that a listen. You know, they were, they were a band that I, I remember use loving at the time and i've heard yeah. i'll have heard the singles and i've heard <laughs> probably i'll yeah. have heard the songs just through um use playing them at, in the house when we all lived together um so yeah <laughs> cool all right i'll give that a listen um right okay so i'll give you an album then um and uh this album i'm gonna give you um this was like like a big one for me when I first got into it um, and I thought I'll give you it because they've been in the news recently and it, they've become a sort of sad sort of shadow of themselves uh, I'm going to give oh. I'm going to give you um, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy um, Oh no So this is a fucking great record this is this is so good. This is always held up there as like the greatest hip hop records of all time. And I think really the reason for that is the production. The production in in Public Enemy is so unusual and not a lot of hip hop albums or production or producers followed how they how they put together tracks. It's so sort of it's like the certainly the noisiest hip hop ever got, um, hmm. and it's so good. I like they were in the news recently because uh, Flavor Flav and Chuck D had a fallen out, and then rec- <laughs> recently they're now trying to say that that was actually a hoax, you know, because they've got a new fucking staff <laughs> album out, um. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, like when they were at their peak, they were just not just the best rap group at the time, but they were just the best band at the time. Um, okay. Like those two, those two albums, "Takes a Nation of Millions" and "Fear of a Black Planet," are are stone cold killers, absolute classics. But I thought, let's give you the one that I first fell in love with. Uh, yeah, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Just listen to the production on this. Um, it's, it's fucking great. Um, no other hip hop record sounds like it. Even the later albums, they sort of, the the style changed because of sampling laws and various other things. So yeah, mm-hmm. um, I know that I dragged you to see Public Enemy. Um, Public Enemy live, especially in the two thousands. Um, you know, it might be good fun, but it's never going to capture the sound of the records because, especially those early records, are just so dense in terms of the production mm. and the the sampling that's going on and everything else that it's. The albums just sound cacophonous and busy and nasty, and you'll never be able to recreate that live. They're a good, a good fun live, but you're never going to get that sound. So I think that's mm. where, you know, like I would go see them live because I love them, and I'm get, I'm getting the enjoyment of seeing those songs. But in terms of how the actual sound live compared to the albums, it's just like. Night and day. So I think I think okay. I think you may actually get into it because you're not being forced to watch it in fucking <laughs> the O2 Academy or something. Yeah, maybe that was the downfall. It was like it felt very stilted and I felt very uh at odds with it because it was like basically my first experience with them. Yeah. Like I was thrown into the deep end. Yeah. So yeah, uh, maybe it will it will help. I'm I'm even looking at the Wikipedia page, and it's literally five out of five, A plus, five out of five, five out of five, ten out of ten, ten out of ten, five out of five, five out of five, it, ten out of ten. It is. I have it not. Great. I've not seen an album get unanimous five out of five quality in forever. I can't actually think of another album that gets that. No, no. It's. I mean, it is. It is great. It is great. 
Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I've left it until now because it's one of those albums that is so sort of like, um, like key to my appreciation growing up. It was like, ooh, I'm slightly. <laughs> Um, slightly nervous about oh, some, somebody coming in and reevaluating this. Um, but yeah, no, but I think <laughs> I think um, especially because it's been in the news recently, and mm-hmm. like, just fucking stop. Just like <laughs> like you made ma- a few masterpieces. Stop now, just. <laughs> but you know, people need to eat, so you know. Um, <laughs> But anyway, there. so yeah, there you go. Looking forward to your thoughts on that. Uh, hopefully we'll actually meet the next time we record. Cool. So we'll wrap up and we will see you hopefully next month. Yep, see you um, So yeah, listen to more music listen. and yep. we'll speak to you later. Yep, cool. Uh, go back and listen to the, the old episodes. Uh, they're good fun. <laughs> um, yep. And uh, hopefully see you soon. And take care of yourself, everybody.